Welcome everyone to PRT. That stands for Pretty Righteous Time. And we're here, I'm just kidding, it's Paranormal Roundtable. Or as some people call it, Paranoid Roundtable. I don't know why they call it that, because we're not very paranoid, are we, Tony? Are we? Uh, I am. I'm pretty freaked oh, yes, out. Oh, right yes. Okay. That's, oh, yeah. You are very freaked out. It's about all stuff. nighttime and dark and stuff. I'm scared. We don't <laughs> usually record this late. Actually, yeah, you're right. We've been working so much and everybody, everything's been going on that we, we, we have to record really late at night tonight. We're sneaking in and sneaking out. So, folks, uh, let me just go ahead and drop it to you. Dots Wolfman 88 at gmail.com. Dots Wolfman 88 at gmail.com. Send, send us your crazy stories, your scary stories, your spooky stories. A lot of weird stuff going on in the world today. We're not going to get into a bunch of current events. We have a, a show here we got to do. We yeah. do want to tell you that. Uh, to check out our paranormal, our, our uh, website. It's uh, prtpodcast.com, prtpodcast.com. We have a bunch of stuff there. We have our, a link to our merch store. We have a, a nice little art gallery. People, you know, send in submissions, things that they've drawn. It's pretty neat. Yeah. yeah go check it out. Check it out, man. It, and and uh, you can get T-shirts. You can get coffee mugs, whatever. You can get, you know, stickers. So we also would like people to check out our groups on Facebook. Tony, you have a group. Yep, Paranormal Encounter. Paranormal Encounters. And I just, as, as the latest count, I saw that Nelly is really beating you up now. In yeah, the Paranormal Lounge. Lounge. So uh, my wife, what it is. my wife's group is Paranormal Lounge. She's been busy. She's been a busy bee, uh, getting on there and sending invites and and doing whatever. So you got Paranormal Lounge, which is run by Nelly and Tony's in that group too, and of course, and then Nelly's in Paranormal Encounters. But but th- those those two groups, one's t- Tony's and one's Nelly's, and uh, we're all part of the uh, Paranormal Roundtable group. Every Friday in, until. We run out of supplies. We're going to be doing a book giveaway every Friday. And I just talked to Ken Gerhardt again and re-upped. So we're going to get some more books in from him. We just got another shipment in from Lyle Blackburn and David Weatherly. Yeah, I saw those. Yeah, so everybody just be uh, be putting their comments. When we drop the link, it'll be on the Paranormal Roundtable group page. Once again, that's the Facebook Paranormal Roundtable group page on Facebook. So if nothing else, get get your Facebook account in order so you can get on there and be a part of what we're doing on the group, and then you could stay abreast of Paranormal Roundtable news. It'll give you the latest and what's going on, and it'll also there's all kinds of crazy stories people post all the time, links to all kinds of other stuff, other groups with paranormal themed stuff, Dogman, ghosts, UFOs, you name it, they're on there. And what they do is they'll 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 send links to our on our group, and you can get on there and follow the links. Lori Shivers, she has a, a paranormal reality, cryptids and paranormal reality. And then uh, Michael Moran has a... Uh, cryptid Squad. <laughs> he's never going to live that down. Cryptid Squad. And so he's got that one. Michael Moran is also a native Texan. He's from from uh, from North Texas. And he's up there at Fort Worth. And that's where Lyle Blackburn is based, too. Nick, Nick Redfern is up in Dallas. Weatherly's down here in the Hill Country with us. And... Uh, Ken Gerhard is down in San Antonio. So it's one big Texas family here. And, you know, so that being said, we have all those groups. We have all that going on. Get on there every Friday. We, we drop the link to the show, post a comment on there, and we choose uh, Zane and Scorpion and Diablo are our, our three uh, magistrates that choose. Impartial. No. Yeah, you know. they try to be impartial and they just pick a name and off the comments. And we try not to. Uh, pick the same people hasn't happened yet, but uh, I guess if it does, it does. But we're t- <laughs> we try to pick a different person every week, and so just everybody. If it comes a time when everybody that's commenting is already had something and already won, well, I guess they'll they'll get it again. Some people are complaining on YouTube that they they don't have Facebook, and I, I'm sorry for those people who do not participate in Facebook because that is the only way to win the prize. And that is to be on the Facebook group, and um, so I apologize to those who do not have Facebook. You people need to get with the program. <laughs> and <laughs> Facebook is not. I, I only honestly, I, I wish they had a better platform. Like we had a better platform where you could, you know, speak more freely. But then again, when that happens, people will abuse it and say things that are ridiculous, and then you have people getting offended. But you, you know, I guess in this day and age, everybody's offended by everything. So what does it really matter? But anyways, that being said, we're going to get started on the show. 
what, what we're talking about today, Tony, do you want to tell people what we're talking about? About a bridge, right? Isn't some kind of Hexy bridge? Oh, God. Ha- okay. Hamsy bridge? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hoxie. Hoxie bridge, not Hamsy bridge. Okay. You know, no, we were, that's what it was. We were, yeah, that's what it was. We were just there <laughs> the other day. Tony, you want to tell, tell them about our trip out there? Uh, yeah, we drove out to this. Uh, I didn't know we were. What it, I've never been there before, and I didn't know the area, so we went to kind of like this park. We started walking around, and all of a sudden, you know, you go out a little bit off road into the the bushes into the and into the woods, and you just there's just this big bridge there that leads to nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a big bridge. Yeah. It's just a trail, and it seems like a, a massive bridge to be just there for a trail. What it is is basically a. Uh, our, our uh, studio's haunted. We just heard something <laughs> fall. There's nobody there but me and Tony. So anyways, what it is, is this uh, this bridge, um, that, that kind of freaked me out. So what what it's in the middle of nowhere now, but that's because it was moved. And uh, what it was is the, the, the town of Hoxie, where the bridge originally was, was a place, uh, it was on Pecan Creek, and, and Pecan Creek was an offshoot of the San Gabriel River. This is back before... Granger Lake. Now, Granger Lake, of course, I'll get into that and why that, how that came to be. The guy that founded it was named John Hoxie, and he was a railroad magnate. The he, the the, ra- the railroad interchange was big. It was used for the cotton, you know, because a lot of cotton grown there, a lot of corn and other things that are grown in that area of Taylor, where I'm from. The surrounding community, especially to the south of Taylor, in particular, there's a lot of, of farmland. And uh, then if you go a little further east, then it becomes like Piney Woods. And so, anyways, th- there are a lot of legends and stories about the area of Hoxie. Now, um, his his nephew's name was Mortimer. They together, uh, he brought a bunch of, of, of exotic horses. They They imported breeds of cattle, and they experimented with irrigation. They, they bred different types of cattle. They brought a lot of Brahma bulls and, and bred them with, with female uh, Hereford bull, Hereford cows. And then they, they bred them with uh, Angus, Brangus. Of course, Brangus is a type of Brahma bred with an Angus. And they were responsible for bringing a lot of that to the area. Now, what happened, though, uh, the story, the legend goes back to there was a, uh, a guy that owned a lot of that land and he was killed shortly after the Civil War during Reconstruction. The story was, and it's kind of been washed from history, but I know the story from by heart because my grandparents told me, and their their parents, of course, know the story, and everybody in that area knows the history. And he was killed during Reconstruction. He was one of those Confederates that didn't want to let go. And so they they came and told him, there's going to be a heavy tax on your land because during Reconstruction, the North told the South, you're going to pay all this money. He told them, I'm not going to do that. They, they, they hung him. They killed him. And supposedly, upon hanging this man, his head came off. And so that land that belonged to him was partitioned off. It was like 12,000 acres. Well, a big chunk of that was sold to John Hoxie, who came from Chicago. Now, almost instantaneously, there were rumors that the land was haunted, that there was a specter that was seen many times riding through the cotton fields and, and, and harassing the cattle. And it was of a uh, captain who was a cavalry captain in the, in the, uh, in the Confederate army. And supposedly this guy didn't have a head. And uh, that is the story. Sometimes people would see him with a head and, or sometimes people would see just a hat and they would see no head. Uh, th- th- he's just a floating hat or just like- yeah just like like his head was not was not there there was just a hat and then there was like him with like with the little short cape that they would have they wore you know like the the officers of both sides they all went to the same academies you know to train mm-hmm. it was after all civil war he's not the only ghost horseman in texas now i know one 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 of the mexican folklore ones we did with chief he talked about a bandito that rides around all over west texas and then there's another one there's a conquistador that rides around from Austin, it would be the the headless conquistador. He would be, I guess, going towards Burnett uh, near Lake Buchanan. People see him, and that is because there was a mission not far from there, and we may talk about him one day. But anyways, we have a uh, a lot of these horsemen running around and harassing and antagonizing people. 
That's one of the stories. Now, there's also a, a very strange thing that happened. There, 1921, it, it flooded. There was a town not far from Hoxie. Hoxie was a, was a pretty hustle bustle town at one time, and just as its sister city was called Friendship. Friendship ended up flooding in 1921, and it was it was pretty much they evacuated it. Nobody lived there again. And then in 19, uh, let's see, I, bet, I believe it was in 1980, they decided to build Granger Dam, which became Granger Lake, which created Granger Lake from the San Gabriel River. And the town of Friendship was completely flooded, never to be seen again until year 2000. Okay. So I just lied. I said never to be seen again. The tops of it was were eerily peeking out. And I saw this. I drove out there. Uh, I think I drove out there with Chief, actually, and we went out there and we looked, and you could see the tops of the buildings, like the ch- the, ch- uh, the chapel, you know, sticking out of the water because of the the drought. The drought was so bad. They say you're not supposed to go swimming to to in certain spots in Granger Lake because if you if you dive down in there, you could get caught in a building. Mm-hmm. You get stuck in a building, and you become part of the of the uh, waterscape, I guess, and that's it. And that has actually happened too. People have gone missing, missing, and they've had to dive for them, and it's a very dangerous uh, deal driving within those buildings down there. So that is a that's a weird thing. People go fishing out in danger, uh, uh, gr- danger Granger Lake all the time, and they report weird things. In fact, I was just on one of the groups the other day, and somebody who was from Granger got on there, and I was surprised that he was on there. Um, and I was like, "Wow, you're from Granger," and we started talking. It's a very small little town that's kind of a, a a small little satellite town of my town, which is a very small town in itself. My town's like, I think it's less than 20,000 people for sure. And then Granger, I think, I don't know what the population is of that, maybe 5,000 at the most. They do have several stores and things like that. Hoxie had, uh, um, it's right outside of Granger. It had a post office. It had a school, it had a cotton gin, had a saddlery, it had a... Uh, a blacksmith. They had some stuff going on there. And it was a huge ranch. It was 9,000 acres that used to belong to one Confederate captain who I don't know his name. I've tried to, I've tried to research it. I've asked people. Nobody knows when they took the land from him. I guess they kind of washed him from history because he, uh, Hoxie was a northerner who was originally from Chicago. And he recruited a lot of people to come and work like him and his nephews they recruited a lot of people from the Chicago area, which, by the way, is where my grandfather on my mom's side came from. He came from Chicago, and he was born in like nineteen, the 19-teens or something like that. And then he uh, ended up in Taylor uh, in the 30s as a young man to work on the railroads. And so that's how he ended up there. But the Hoxie, eventually, it, it was pretty much, it just kind of dried up. Um, that area was prone to, prone to flooding and there were two bridges. One was really small. It was only about 25 yards long. And then the other one was, I don't know how long that's the Hoxie bridge. I know we were on it the other day and we will try to put some photos, uh, pictures up of, of us on that bridge. And so you can see it's now falling apart. Like Tony mentioned earlier, it's decrepit. And if you walk across it, cause they have it ca- caged off, but I managed to come up in there and we walked all over it. And Tony you were the one that told me, like, hey, you know, fat yeah. boy. Hey, fat boy. Uh, <laughs> stay off the uh, the beams. All right, like, stay, stay on, on the, the beams. beams. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you and Anthony and Zane were, were with, with us, and y'all were on the other side of the bridge. And I asked Nellie, and I was like, what did he say? And she's like, stay on the beams. Because she was worried that my big fat self was going to go crash through the, the, the floor or whatever. I like to think that I'm just robust and muscular. But, yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit chubby. So I'm sitting there going like, man, dude, I, I don't want to get stuck in here. What what a, a disaster that would be. You'd probably have to get the Army Corps of Engineers to come back and, and <laughs> pull me the jaws of life. <laughs> I'd become another statistic of the bridge. So what happened was, and I'm kind of jumping around here, in 1921, the bridge that was reconstructed. Now, the bridge, the original bridge was destroyed. There was a bridge that was there that was destroyed who really w- was not it was not made for uh traffic from vehicles so in 1921 most people in Texas still had you know horses I've talked about this before there's not a lot of electricity in Texas until the 50s so you're talking about way back then there was nothing but horses and stuff and uh the stories that go back to that the, the original bridge I mean there's stories that go back to the original bridge my grandfather who was born in like I think he was I think he was born in 1920 or something like that or maybe he was born in, in 21. I know he was something like that. 
Anyways, he had told me when he was a kid that they were told, you know, don't ever walk or walk on that bridge at night because the horseman would, would, would come after you. He would chase you. And supposedly it was like a game when they were kids. And now there was a story my grandfather told me of him and his buddy Jake and that they were walking across this bridge. This is the, the first of, of many stories I'm going to tell you. They were walking across the bridge. This was at, in the 1930s. And he was carrying two, they were carrying two puppies. Him and his buddy each had a puppy and it was lightning and it was really dark. And the only light they could see was because Jake lived down the road from them. He, my grandfather, you know, and they were walking across this bridge and supposedly the lightning was how the, the only way they could see. And when they got to the end of the bridge, uh, lightning struck and it hit the bank and it hit a tree or something. And when it did, they heard a loud, like a shrieking noise coming from over the river. And my grandfather dropped the puppy that he was carrying and took <laughs> off running. And I guess this uh, dog ran. It had sense enough to follow him in it. And they just put the, the dogs on the ground. They ran back to, 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 I guess, from his place to Jake's place. And uh, they they got to to the house. They then. So when they got back to the house, they asked the mom and they said, hey, what? Something shrieked at us like a scream. She said that that was the banshee of the bridge. Now, this is another story. There is supposedly a shrieking woman, a banshee, that would actually scream at the, and that was the, from the original bridge. Nobody knows why that is or what that was. There was a legend that, it, that a woman had drowned during the flood, and it was, it was very tragic. Her family was, was trying to, to save her, and she got washed away, and she ended up underneath the bridge. They found her caught in some debris underneath the bridge. And that, that she, her screaming, they could hear her screaming all the way down the river. And supposedly when it would rain, then that, then her screams could be heard. Now this was told to me by not just my grandfather, but a friend of mine's grandfather when we were growing up, he told us stories of this bridge and of the shrieking woman that is, you know, way back. Okay. So when they reconstructed the bridge in 1921, after the flood, it sat where it was at over the, over the San Gabriel river and, you know, for the going into the town of Hoxie, the town of Hoxie eventually dried up and faded away. The Army Corps of Engineers moved the bridge in 19, they dismantled it in 1979 and in 1982, they rebuilt the bridge at the location at, at, in Taylor Park or in, in, outside of Granger by Granger Lake, where you were at, Tony, where we went. And there is a plaque there. Now, the story goes, and, and uh, you know about the story of the uh, convict. He was. When they were rebuilt, when they re, when they dismantled it and then they, and they put it back together in 1982, which is only a couple of years later, they used convicts to do it, to, to, to re, I'm sorry, I, I got that totally wrong. When they reconstructed in 1921, there were convicts that were used to reconstruct the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. So I messed, messed yeah, that I up. I remember this. Yeah. But then it got dismantled in 1979, then reconstructed where it's at now in 1982. So if anybody wants to go visit it, it's in, it's a, a Granger Dam. Right there. Now, this, the bridge has a lot of history, a lot of history. The wood is obviously from the 1920s because you can tell it's like it's it's just crumbling apart, you know. So, I wouldn't recommend anybody going and running around on that bridge because you'll fall through. I mean, I'll be surprised if you last 20 seconds on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have it closed off for a reason. And maybe they're going to they're gonna redo the wood or something where it can be used on the trails again. Um, but I, I messed that up folks. So in 1921, when it was reconstructed after the flood destroyed it, the original wood, they redid it, you know, they took the, they took it down, they rebuilt it. And so this bridge from, from 1921 is the one that's still there in, 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 in Taylor park, but it was, it was dismantled in 1979 because it was old and decrepit and they redid it in 1982. They, they spruced it up and then it sits where it's at now since 1982. So that's been there. For gosh, was that forty years? It's like forty years almost. So, so that being said, that that's what's going on with that. But th there was a, a a group of convicts that were that were that in 1921 they were used to reconstruct the bridge to build it, going in its original location over the San Gabriel River. Now, what happened with that was there was one convict in particular who was very surly had a bad attitude and he was a malcontent and he caused problems. And back in 1921, if you were a convict in Texas, you had nothing, you were nothing, you had no rights, you had nothing. So this guy caused problems. So they, sh they beat him and they shot him. And this is a true story. Like this is, I think this is on the plaque, isn't it, Tony? 
Uh, yeah, it's yeah, on the plaque. It's mentioned on the plaque. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they hung him from a tree <laughs> over the bridge. Now, that gave rise to ghost stories of, of, of a headless ghost that would walk around on the bridge. That's not the same ghost. Now, there's a headless horseman that's a Confederate soldier that I've heard stories about, multiple stories. They're, most of them are pretty brief encounters, but I got one in particular that I could tell you. And then this guy's ghost was s- said to haunt teenagers that would go out there. They'd like to go out there on the bridge because we're out in the middle of nowhere and it's over the water. And there was a little spot right off the bridge where you could kind of park. And I know this because my parents and all my friends' parents would go out there. And it was kind of like, hey, you're going out to the bridge. You know, it's haunted. So in the 60s and 70s growing up, they were they would go out to Hoxie Bridge. And the story was that if you were out there, sometimes they, they would get a tapping on the glass. This, this, this I've heard this story multiple times growing up. And they would turn and look. And they would see in the classic pinstripe unif- uniform of the of the convicts of the, the 1920s, kind of like the Brother Where Art Thou look, you know, they would see this stripe, this convict in stripes, and he would be standing there mutilated. In some cases, that I, w- I was told one particular story about my friend's mother. She said that, that she saw it when she was 16, and he was holding his head. Oof. And she swore up and down that he, he, his head was like, like waist level. She turned and looked, and it was like she looked up, and there was a body, and it was holding a head, and the head was like the eyes were closed, and it, it just he looked like he was it was deceased for sure, but the the body was just there without a head. Now, another story uh, that I got from a friend of mine who's actually his last name was actually Taylor, so he was because from the town of Taylor's family obviously had something to do with the founding of it, but he told me a story. Uh, his friend told me a story. And and they didn't live in Taylor anymore. They had they they were living out in a town called Bartlett, which is outside of this of of, of Granger. And he had told me a story that his uh, grandfather's friend, basically same thing, but it was even more dramatic because they were out messing around and they ran out of gas supposedly, and 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 or the car wouldn't start. I don't remember because I know there was a lot of weird stuff that would happen there. Uh, everybody would tell me, like my my friends' parents and everything. You go out there, and sometimes your car wouldn't start. There was like these electrical anomalies that would take place. Whatever it was out there would drain your battery. And so he said, "I gotta I gotta get a hold of my friends." So he walked from the bridge and went further up the road to try try to at at the crossroads up there to try to flag somebody down to try to get because every now and then there'd be a farmer going through there. He wasn't that late at night. It was like dusk. By the time he got help, he went back. He his girlfriend had was hiding down on the floorboards and she was hysterical you know and this is almost like an urban legend but this th- these are people that this really happened to and so my friend told told me uh, that that his grandfather's friend had basically uh, uh and his grandfather later verified this story too to us that this is what he really believed happened this guy's name was Brandon and so Brandon got back to his car and his girlfriend wouldn't open the door. She said that she kept hearing like a scraping noise on the on the the roof of the car. First, it was like a scraping noise, and she heard a thud. And at at first, she was like not really, you know, she wasn't totally afraid. She just thought, man, we went, must have parked underneath a tree or something. It was right off of the bridge under a tree. So when she got out, she looked, and at first glance, she just saw the tree branch hanging over the car. People claim that that's the tree where the guy was hung. And supposedly his, she, she, she looks, she does a double take and there's a body hanging upside down and he, his hands, his fingers were scraping the top of the car. She, he had a head, like it wasn't headless and the eyes opened up and looked at her. And so she screamed and ran and got back in the car and got down in there. And she claimed that whatever this thing was like flopped down onto the car, crawled down off the side of the car and was, began to try to open the doors. And when she looked up and for a brief moment, she saw hollowed out eyes. That was a very, that was a very common occurrence. Now, there was another thing that happened uh, back in the 70s or 60s, I guess, the, the mid to late 60s. There was a woman who disappeared from her house in Granger and supposedly she went to bed. Now, back in those days, you're air conditioned. You just open up a window. You know, that's pretty much it. You so, open up two windows to get that cross breeze. Yeah, cross breeze. So in 1966, you know, she lived in an old farmhouse on the edge of town. She she opened up a window and they went to bed. They never, they wake up the next day and she's not in the room. 
They never found her. Nobody ever found her. But they claim that in that area of the San Gabriel, uh, just west of there, that that people would see a woman floating across water. Now, my mother claimed years ago that when she was little, she had she was kind of like sent as a little snitch to f- go with her older sisters when they would go out on their little forays. My abuelita, my grandmother, she was like, uh-uh, you're not going out. You t- take Mariana with you. You know, and so she would take me and my mom, Marianne, would go with them and she would kind of be like the snitch. And then they would have to bribe her with candy and, and stuff so that she wouldn't tattletale on them because they were out smooching boys and stuff. And so they would go ride around out there. And she said they went and rode around out there. The car, uh, from what I remember her telling us, the car stalled over the bridge and they see this white, this lady in white floating across the water because that was another spirit that supposedly ended up over there. The story behind her was that she was abducted by someone or something uh, out of the window, was killed in her nightgown, and she just wanders around over the water. Doesn't really mess with anybody. Does, there's nobody claiming that she's attacking them or anything like that. Now, that same area of the San Gabriel, there's also stories of these white-faced Bigfoots. I know we covered that on the uh, big the siege by Bigfoot that we did. Yeah. Those stories kind of died out, you know, after like the the 1950s or whatever. But that that area is it was inundated with stories and legends of these. My grandparents and her friends went camping out there near San Gabriel when that bridge was still intact back in the early 70s, and they claimed that something was up on the ridge and was throwing giant boulders down into the water. And they, my grandmother, claimed that they were just humongous rocks, you know. So that that's another weird anomaly. People were claiming that, that they would see these these hairy looking creatures in the woods around there that they would throw rocks and stuff. I had a weird incident. One story I wanted to tell you was really bizarre. Uh a buddy of mine's stepdad. I stayed at his house for a sleepover and his stepdad was a pretty cool guy. He worked with my dad and he at the power plant and he began regaling us with stories of his childhood a lot of funny stuff he's a real gregarious funny guy Ooh, big words huh big, big i'm using them big words or are you how's life in the big city as my uncle muff would say uh yeah well so so what happened was he told us all these stories and one of them scared the crap out of me as a kid they had he had two things happen to him in those woods out near hoxie one thing was they were out there one 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 day messing around or whatever and they had bb guns and they were shooting anything that moved out there near near the water and uh, cuz they lived out there and they were shooting and then they see this thing floating in the water and at first he thought it was like a giant garbage bag and then they were like what is that so one of them shot it with the bb gun it pops up out of the river this was probably like not even a quarter mile from the bridge he said you could see the bridge and it popped up and it turned and it looked at him and it was one of those troglodyte, Bigfoot, whatever type creatures with a very pale face. And it, and it began to wade out of the water and go toward them. And he said that he, his friend dropped their little Red Rider BB guns and just took off running. And they ran. He said it was two miles back to their house. And he said they ran. And he said they were about a mile down the road and they were going through like a ditch and they were falling into the ditch and it had been raining a lot, you know. And this thing didn't stop. Like it didn't stop. Once they got to the driveway – and he said the driveway was a dang quarter mile long. Then they were run, running down the driveway. Then it, it got to the end of the road. They could still see it. And it kept going. It followed them. And then it got about halfway up the driveway. And then, and then their dogs all came out. And he said he had about four or five dogs. And they all came running out toward it. And then it took off. And, and, and it left. And he said that about two years went by. And, they, and then they moved. And he said he never went far from the yard after that. But uh, when he was a kid, <clears throat> he said he was about seven. He said this was about a year or two uh, before that, because he was only about eight or nine when that happened. He said he was seven years old, and uh, this would have been like in the, in, the, in the late 50s, that they were driving, going across that bridge, and when they got right up to the, to, to the bridge to go onto the bridge, this is what he told us, they saw like an orange light to the right, and right, off, right up off of the bank, a horse jumps up on, the, this is what he told us, jumps up, gets right in front of the car, and he said they got a very good look at it, and it, and it had a sword in its hand. It was a it was a, a soldier, and he said it looked just like, like you would see like a Confederate cavalryman dressed up in his officer's uniform, had the tassels. He said you could see everything. He said it was like it was glowing, <clears throat> and he said that it kind of it kind of 
turned the horse in a, in a, in like a, in like a circle. And he said his dad just hit the gas and it, he drove right past it. And he said that this thing, it kept pace with them across the bridge. And he said that it was like right there. He was in the back seat of the passenger side and his older brother was on the other side. And he said they were screaming and crying, freaking out because this thing was running alongside him and he didn't have a head. It was literally a headless horseman dressed as a Confederate soldier. Now, his dad tried to rationalize it and told him, oh, it was somebody acting. They were pretending, you know. He said the shoulders were too high. You know, they had a, you know, and he said, bull crap. It was, it was just a headless guy on a horse. And he said, and it was glowing like a pale, like a bluish, uh, uh, pale color. You know, he said it was terrible. It was terrifying. So those were two incidents that he told us. Uh, and, and going back, like, I know my, uh, my uncle JC told me a story years ago. Uh, him and my uncle SD were always telling us crazy stories. And SD, you kind of couldn't really trust him because he'd tell you anything if you believe it. <laughs> but JC was the more, you know, and I was talking to my uncle Butch the other day. And Butch, you know, he he would he told me straight out, he said, I believe if JC backed it up. Now, JC, Uncle JC told us one time, you know, we were out on the porch. You know, they had this real, really cool house. It was one of those houses that was like they had a a, a back porch with a, like a it was screened in all the way. And the house, the, the the a lot of the rooms were wide open, and it kind of was like in a in a in an L shape the way the house was built. And I'm telling you this because it was a really cool house, right? And just this is how the houses were made back then. And and through one of the rooms, you, you know, there was like this wide open hallway in the middle, and the, you could close the, the the house off from any of those doors, but you could walk along the porch from from one side of the porch and then walk into the kitchen. And you would never have to go back inside the house. You see what I'm saying? Like the doors, yeah. there were doors to all yeah. the rooms. Yeah. And he told me that there was a house that was, that that house was actually designed by the same guy that built that house. It was a house that was just like that on the San Gabriel. And he was telling me that that house uh, that that he, that his friend had, that it was the same builder. And he he built that design. It was not, It was unique to that particular builder. And so he was saying the house was laid out just like his or whatever. And he was telling us that that one day he was staying the night over at that at his friends or whatever they were sleeping you know because they had been chopping uh, wood, uh, clearing wood or whatever, getting ready for winter and because uh, that's what people did back then, and they helped each other out with their cows and their hogs and all that. And he said that that they were out there on the back porch just like that the the, the same setup as his house or whatever because it was the same builder like I said. And they were out there, and the, the, his friend's dad was smoking a cigar. Now, this would have been before the turn of the century, probably. I'm pretty sure J.C. was born in, like, you know, before the turn of the century. So this was probably back in the, like, you know, in the t- turn of the century, you know. And so he said that this, uh, they saw this ro- a horse, like, just coming up the road. Like, they could see it from the back of the road because the house was was turned the opposite of the, of the road. You had a ba- It came through the back way. And the rider came right up to, to halfway to the house, and they were like, what is that? And so he said that his friend's dad stood up and, you know, and, and went out to greet this guy. It was at dusk, and he was like, why is this horseman, you know, coming up onto my property? Now, back in those days, nobody had a car. It was everybody rode on a horse, but it was very weird because this guy was dressed as a Confederate soldier. And he's like, I saw it with my own eyes, you know. And him and his brother, who was my other un- great great uncle, uh, were there and he was a little younger than JC, but they remembered seeing it. And it was like, it was there, you know, like it was on the, on the road. And he said that as his friend's dad, uh, started going towards it, it just kind of like, like faded away, you know? And it was just like, it kind of shimmered and like, it was just gone. Boom. Like it just evaporated. And so that, that's a weird story. And, and, and so every time I would sit on that back porch, even though it wasn't the same house, I, I would always think, man, that's weird. You know, something could come up on the road like that. And so the stories of this uh, this ghost were never like of it harassing anybody. I mean, uh, never. Ne- it was always just it harassing people, not of it like attacking people. It would pull out a sword, and it would chase people. Like it would chase people. Like uh, I know that the Hoxie family. I had had a story that was told to me that that the Hoxie the people that worked at the Hoxie cotton gin had been harassed by this thing that it would come through the cotton fields. And it was just basically an angry spirit because um, it had been displaced, you know. And, you know, by the 1980s, when the, the bridge got moved, the stories became less frequent. Now, there is another bridge in that area, and it's and it's up the road from there. And it's a small little, like, 20, not even 20 yards, I don't think, across. And uh, they, they said that this thing, uh, it was called Black Bull Bridge. 
Now, I know Anthony uh, and me were at my uh, friend's uh, house. The guy that I actually saw the dog man with, Daniel Robles, his dad had an encounter with this bull. Uh, and he told my wife and Anthony uh, this story and my brother. You know, he's getting up there in age now. He's in his 70s. But he he told this story when he was a young man. He was driving around out there. And uh, this is right down the road from the Hoxie Bridge. And that he was driving in this, the, the largest bull he'd ever seen. It looked like a uh, one of those Brangus, you know, that it got up on the onto the road or whatever, an Angus bull, and and he said it, he tried to 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 you know drive like to push it, you know, like maybe if he bumped it, it'd move. And he said that when he went to push it, the bull the, the the that his car was moving going forward, but the bull didn't budge. It just sat there, and he said I could feel myself, you know, I could feel something. I was pushing against something like it was flesh. But he said that this bull just walked right into the hood of his car. And so he just like drove right through it. Wait, so he was like basically kind of pressing on the gas. Mm-hmm. And then Trying all of to get a sudden it to move. it just went like right yeah, through and it. Yeah, and next thing you know, he drove right through, through the bull. The bull was literally like in his car, like it went right through the car. And now I've heard stories of this bull like challenging cars and it will materialize and it will, and they call it Black Bull Bridge and it will, it will actually challenge vehicles. It's a humongous car, uh, bull. It'll, it'll literally span the entire like width of the bridge. Now this bridge, I've been, I, w- I took my wife over to this bridge. This one, the one that you went to, Hoxie, mm-hmm. it's as wide as that. It's just not as long, but it's a, it's a small little bridge, you know, and, and it, it just, it, that bull will stay on that bridge. Nobody knows the origin of it, where it came from or why it's there, but that bridge is supposedly haunted by this bull and it will challenge people. The story, the, the, the stories that I got, they're not nothing that I can confirm. Nobody knows for sure, but I think that, 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 that the legend goes along with the, uh, the headless soldier and that it was one of his, it was like a prized bull and that that is cursed. It's a cursed animal. And it just, it, it guards the bridge just as he guards his Hoxie bridge and keeps people free. He tries to keep people from going back and forth. And you know, he harasses people that that bull does the same thing. There are stories of black dogs out there. Now I can get into those. The ho- like, r- r- does the bull actually like do damage to vehicles? Yes. Yes. It has actually done damage to a vehicle. A buddy of mine that lives out there or used to live out there. I don't know if I say his name is because he didn't get permission for him. I'll call him Scott. That's not his real name. He claims that back in the, in the eighties, uh, he was a kid. I think he says like 1984 or something like that. And h- him and his dad were driving across that bridge. Just not, not nothing real exciting or anything, but they hit a bull. Like he said, it was just like he was look. He was actually <laughs> in the back seat reading a comic book. And he and, and I know you asked this because you probably heard. You, I might have told you this, but he was reading a comic book, and the they hit something, and he looks up, and this bull just kind of turned to the side. But he said that. The weirdest thing happened, like the bull actually leaped into the into the into the river below. When he looked down, there was nothing there. Like it literally jumped off the bridge. And it put a big size dent in the side of his dad's sedan. So yeah, that there have been uh, reports of damage done by this bull. Not only that story, there's another one I got from a friend of mine's dad who's probably about the same age as as uh, Sal. Uh, and when I say Sal, folks, I don't mean my former co host, I mean my friend Daniel Robles' dad who had the the, the who pushed his vehicle through this, this spectral bull. This is the other story I got. And, that, and then after that, they're all just kind of like they saw a bull on the bridge and they drove past it. There's nothing really fantastical or anything about it. But this one was another one where the bull actually uh, challenged somebody and it hit the front of the car and the guy decided to, to, to fight back and he gunned it because he had a big old, you know, Chevy from back in the you know, the muscle car days. Some text and stuff right there. Yeah, he tried to like <laughs> challenge it and the bull actually, he was spinning his tires on the bridge and the bull wouldn't let him pass. And then all of a sudden he just like lurches forward and just drives, you know, almost off the bridge uh, because the bull just dematerialized. So that, those are those. And then the rest of them are just people bull seeing it. Bull is just in and a around. giant bully basically. Basically a bully. Yeah, that's all he is. Nobody's been hurt by it as far as I know. I've heard uh, I've heard somebody say that they heard somebody say you know one of those things where it kind of goes on and you can't really verify it that it has chased people and they've jumped into the water you know I've heard that a lot I've I've heard different versions of the headless convict too the convict uh, they say that it, uh, I believe a priest prayed over it I, I can I can maybe see if I can find that 
that his soul finally found peace, you know, because he was constantly harassing uh, people on that, on that, on that bridge or whatever. They say that he, that a priest prayed over him. And eventually he here, it says right here, it says erected at the turn of the century of the San Gabriel river, 3.5 miles east of Circleville. The Hoxie bridge was, was, let's see, washed 300 yards downstream during the devastating 1921 flood. Austin Brothers was awarded a contract to reconstruct the bridge, and a team of convicts, laborers, was sent from Huntsville to perform the work. According to local legend, one of the prisoners, reputed to have been a troublemaker, was shot in the head by a guard. The mutilated body was hung from a tree as a grisly warning against further trouble at the work site. A cruel death and no burial. Perhaps these were the reasons that the prisoners' headless ghosts haunted the area river bottom east of the Hoxie Bridge. Area residents tell tales of lovers and late-night travelers frightened by the apparition on Friday nights during the full moon. Uh, mysteriously, a priest's prayers for the prisoner's soul ended the specter's vigil. And I was told that that took place in 1970. It doesn't say it on the plaque, but it, that's supposedly in 1970. According to my aunt's uh, friend told me this when we were kids, and she was very adamant about that. And I know that because of the year. Uh, it was very easy to remember. That was the year my sister was born. And so 1970, that they, there was a priest that went out there. He prayed, and it it stopped, supposedly. Now, there were stories that it continued to go on. That's just a legend that that's what happened, that, that, that he was, that they prayed over his soul. And of course he, he found peace and everybody wants to believe that that's what happened. But as far from what I was, what I, what I've been told, I got stories going past that and that he continued to, to pull his shenanigans until the bridge was completely dismantled and then kind of just laid to the side until 1982 when it was reconstructed in, in Taylor park where we were at Tony. Now that didn't end anything for Hoxie bridge. That bridge is still continued to have weird stuff happen just because it moved. They moved the bridge from the area of the, of where it used to be Hoxie didn't end any of it. I got a, I got a cousin, one of my dad's cousins. I don't want to say his name cause I don't know if he, he's, you know, but he told me a story. And I said, even my dad's cause be my cousin too. But he told me a story that on that bridge, there was a, his best friend, that they had an encounter with this convict or whatever, that it supposedly they saw, they heard drip, drip, drip. They were, they were on a, on a double date. There were the two, the guy and a girl in the front guy and the girl in the back. And, and he was in the back seat. They heard drip, 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 like a, like a, you know, yeah, like, like so, that. Yeah. yeah. And so they heard this and they started saying, get out and check. No, you get out and check. No, you get out and check. And everybody's scared. So finally they said, just, just back up and let's get out of here. So when they they pulled out from where they were parked along the side of the bridge, they backed up, and when they got onto the road, they could clearly see uh, what looked like a body hanging upside down by its feet with no head. Because the story was that they hung him from a tree and his head came clean off. So then th they just decided to hang him upside down by his feet and just leave him there the whole time that the bridge was being built, which took a while. You know, and so the corpse began to rot and it was disgusting, but they said that it was there as, as like they said, a grisly reminder not to mess around because Texas, uh, wardens, you know, and, and job bosses on the train, on the chain gang, they weren't interested in your attitude or your opinions. So if you caused problems, they were going to shoot you. You go to prison back then. It didn't matter. They were just, you were property of the state. Yeah. And if they killed you, they killed you. It was very common to mistreat prisoners and do whatever. There wasn't much in the way of civil rights back then. And and it's, it was just a, it was a very, uh, just, you know, local law, wh whatever the local law was, that's what, that's what held sway. And that's all there was to it. Uh, so the local law, you know, pretty much superseded everything else. And so, yeah, you acted up, you got shot. So that's what happened. Well, I mean, harsher Harsher crimes dictate, you know, harsher punishment because they don't really have the, the the prison guards don't really have some of the safeties that they we do now to protect them from these these guys. So they would have to act out a little bit more to make sure that they keep them down and make sure they don't or make sure that they don't act up and cause a problem. Yeah, you better believe if I was a uh, a convict on a chain gang, <laughs> I don't think I would be pushing anybody's buttons i think i'd just be quiet and do what i was told so i didn't get hit in the head with a shotgun butt or shot in the face with it you know um so anyways yeah like you said dude uh, you, you they would they would punish people severely for you know their transgressions 
So, but that created a haunting there at that bridge that went on until it was moved after it was moved because it sat in pieces for about two or three years. And then it was uh, moved to Taylor Park. Now, here's what happened in Taylor Park. Now, we got more stories for that area. There's a there's a giant hog that was supposedly some people were in Taylor Park. This happened in like the late 80s. Uh, got this story. Buddy of mine, Kyle, who who wasn't wasn't from there, but then I'll say he's a friend of mine. He went out there to visit with some family, and uh, he's from an area called Belton, Texas. And they went out there to camp out because there's a lot of campsites out there near Granger. It's very, very pretty, very peaceful out there. People want to go out there and check it out. But Poxy Bridge at night, where it's at now, is still not a peaceful place. A lot of people have a, weird, a lot of weird encounters there. Supposedly him, his brother, his, his stepbrother and his stepdad all went out onto the bridge one night. You know, this happened in the late 80s when he was a kid. No, he wasn't very old. He said he was a teenager, about my, about my age. And uh, he used to play ball against this guy. And uh, he was a pretty good ball player, but that's beside the point. But he was on the bridge, and there was this loud stomping of, like, hooves. Like something was walking on the bridge, and they were on one side. They didn't have flashlights, but they saw red eyes. And they, from what they could make out, it looked like a, a giant hog. And its eyes were glowing red. Like he said, they were red like fireballs, like red fireballs. He said you could clearly see red eyes. And he said that it began to just kind of stomp its feet, and they could they could feel the vibration because it was so large. Now he said it wasn't like huge; it wasn't the size of a car or anything. But he said it looked demonic, definitely. And it had a bunch of teeth, not tusks, just like it had tusks. He said, but it had like teeth, like sharp teeth. And he said that it was staring at them from one side of the bridge, and it began to run toward them. And they ran off the bridge, got onto the trail, ran up that hill that we were on. And when they got to the top, they ran across to their campsite and they looked back and there was nothing there. But it did chase them off the bridge. Now, if that was just one of the stories that I heard about this phantom hog, I would think that that's probably, you know, okay, there's just one thing going on there. But that's not the only story. Now, there was another guy that I, I, I grew up with who... He lived in Taylor, and his mom, actually, they, they owned a uh, restaurant there in Taylor years and years ago. And uh, he went out there with a girlfriend, and they were walking along, and they went, they went and it was, this was in the early 90s, and they went onto the bridge. And they look off to the left, because, like, you know how when you get onto the bridge fr from the park, if you go on it from the park, of course, fr to your left and then the, to your right, and if you, you go all the way across it, the trail kind of just peters out, and it goes up a hill. Well, which would have been our left when we were walking on that bridge. Yeah. Uh, you know how there's, there's like, it's over a creek. It's over a creek bed. He said, but in well, there. it was kind of dry when we went there. It was so dry, it's hard yeah. to tell, but yeah, I could see what it was yeah, supposed it, to be. It, it, it basically is over a creek. It's a small little rinky dink creek. But he said that uh, at, at the, under the creek or whatever, they felt something hit like underneath the, the bridge. And he said he even saw the wood kind of pop up and like break in, in one part. And he said that they were like, what is that? And they heard snorting and, and, and this weird noise. And they kind of like were, were trying to look in between the, the wood to see what it was. And they just saw something down there. And they saw like a flash. And then it, it came out from underneath the bridge. And it turned and it looked up at him. And according to him, uh, this was in high school, he told us that it had glowing red eyes. And that it was uh, a very large and menacing hog. And it began to just... He didn't say it was running fast. He just said it kind of trotted around to that that far side, like which would have been like you know where you, where you guys entered. Y'all went to the far side and climbed up it, and I climbed at the at the entrance. It went onto that far side, and then it 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 came onto the bridge and it began to like run toward them because at that time the the bridge was open periodically, you know, and so they just took off running and got off of the bridge and then ran up that hill and then got back to their car. And they didn't see, they didn't look back to see what this, where this thing was, but it actually did chase them off of that bridge. So that, those are two stories right there. If it was just one or the other, I would think, well, maybe it's a coincidence, but two people telling you that they were chased by a giant hog. That is, that is weird. Yeah. I mean, if it was one person, then you'd be like, oh, they might've just saw a normal hog and then just got a little bit like spooked. Yeah. But when you have two different cases mentioning very specifically the red eyes, just very kind of like, um, it, it gives it a little bit more validity. Validity. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so when, when, uh, when he told me that story, I thought, man, this is weird. Like, you know, that's two people that have told me this story that got, there's gotta be something to it, you know? And w when the other guy told me this story, he told me that story, I think, uh, 
we were like hanging out at a party in Circleville. And he says, yeah, not far from here is the Hoxie Bridge. And that's when he told me that. And I think we were like in high school when he told me that. And I said, oh, man, you know, that's a crazy story, you know. And then, of course, my other friend claimed that that happened to him, you know, because I had told uh, a buddy of mine. And he said, you know what, that happened too. And I'll just, I'll call him Kevin. It's not his real name. But he said, uh, that, that happened to Kevin. And so when I talked to Kevin about it, he he confirmed, yeah, that 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 was, that's, he told me the story, you know. Uh, I got those stories when I was like in high school. And so I think that story he gave me. Uh, this happened in the nineties, but he gave it to me and we were like seniors in high school or something like that. And at that point I had already started keeping like track of the different stories that I had gotten, you know, and was writing them down. And so anyways, yeah, that, the, so that, that's crazy that we didn't see anything. We were there, but there is a weird energy around that bridge. You can definitely feel like there's something there, like something staring at you from the woods or following you. Like if I wouldn't go out there at night. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning when we were there, like the sun was still mostly up. And, you know, I didn't, it wasn't like freaky or anything. It was just kind of like a needle thing. Mm -hmm. But once you like, you, the sun starts getting a little bit lower and you start like really looking out into the woods, then you can really feel the energy is mm -hmm. just changing. It, like you really feel it. Like we were literally there at sundown or like, so it was like the sun was setting and setting. you could just set, uh, feel the change in atmosphere pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah, and that's what Zane said too. He was like, "Dude, he goes, it's not creepy." He goes, "But at night, this place would be super creepy." And it's covered in spiders. Like there's spiders all over it, and spider webs. And so, you know, it's like I went up to Goatman Bridge up in up in uh, north of Dallas last you summer. You challenge challenged him? Actually, I did. And my wife kind of got mad. I was like, you know, talking crap, telling it to come out and see what's up and I challenged the <laughs> Goatman. And so, nothing happened. We did see something weird blue floating in the water, and we never could figure out what it was. It looked like an orb or something. We never could figure out what it was. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we did. And we, and we, I don't think we took much in the way of pictures when we were up there because it was so dark. But uh, we are planning to go back up there at some point when we go up to visit because I have so many friends up in Dallas, up in that area, up in Fort Worth and Dallas. Lance Hoyt lives up there. You know, Starscream lives up there. So many of my friends live up there. Um uh, but you know Michael Moran's up there, so you know Keith, you know Keith, yeah. And so we'll we'll go up there again, and we'll go visit. And I'd like to at some point go up there and 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 take some pictures at that at that bridge. That place is pretty freaky too. It's got a really weird energy, and you could tell that it's you know something creepy can be there. You know, don't have any Goatman stories out of the Granger Bridge area, but I do have two Dogman stories. And now I'll tell you the first one. This one happened at, at the original site of the, of the bridge. Um, this story was given to me. A, a, a guy got in touch with me and said that his dad used to work in Rockdale, which I he didn't he didn't get specific, but if you're working in Rockdale, you probably at the power plant. And so Alcoa had a big plant out there, and the, he his dad liked to go and visit haunted locations, things like that. So. In the, in the late 70s, he got a job working in Rockdale, and he decided to go and take the family out to go drive around and to the Hoxie Bridge because they were looking for the convict ghost because people would do that. They would actually challenge this ghost, too, and they said without fail, something would happen. So they go out there to challenge this ghost because him and his wife were into the whole spooky ghost thing before it became cool. And so they go out there because it's cool now to do it. And, you know, and mm -hmm. even now some people will even give you their names and be like, yeah, you can tell my story with the, you know, which is another thing that's weird. People will give you a story and they'll be like, well, I don't want you saying my name. And then they'll come out on the group and just blurt it out. Oh yeah, I gave them my story. And you know, <laughs> that happened the other day. Yeah. I, I think what it is, is it's like, they don't want you to mention it on air, but like, yeah, I, I think it's like the paranormal roundtable. is just like a group of mm -hmm. like people that, you know, Everyone listens to the show and everyone's, you know, it's exactly what we wanted where people can come and just join and be a part of the, the table. Yeah. And, you know, you, you just say whatever you need to say, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. We don't have any restrictions. So, yeah. So I think that's why he was able to say like to them, yeah, this, I, this is my story. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. I thought. Yeah. And, and so th this guy, he actually went out there and he took his family out there or whatever and they got out and they started his wife started trying to communicate with the convict ghost they heard something splashing in the water and 
they the the son uh, began to scream. Not not the the kid, not the guy that's a grown up now that told me the story, but his his older brother began to scream, and his little sister began to 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 to, to scream and cry, whatever. She was little, and they saw this thing crawling up the embankment. And they see, he he to this day could not tell you exactly that it looked he, the description he could not give me a like a full on description like it was definitely a dog man because he said it almost looked like it could have been like like the head he saw the head the ears were pointing up but he said that it, it, that he wasn't sure if it was like cat like or or like a feline like or dog like because the tail looked weird and I asked him again I was like what does that mean the tail looked weird he said well the tail was elongated. But it definitely had dog man characteristics, but because of the ears. But he goes, there was a, there was a, he remembers it as a dog like entity, but his brother and his sister said that it looked like a cat. Now, if anybody has listened to PRT, if you go back way back in the archives with some of the shows I did with Sal, there was a couple that I got from that area near the San Gabriel River that were of cat people. There was, yeah. a, there was a farmer out there. I know you might, you've heard all the shows. Uh, it was a German farmer out there that claimed that there was a cat. There was a, a family of people who were what he claimed were shapeshifters, and they could turn into these black cats. So this thing, he said that it looked like when it was coming up out of the water, uh, it was almost like it was either a cat or a dog, and it slowly started to kind of morph into like a humanoid shape. And then it got to the top of the bridge, and he said that his family, and they just stood there dumbfounded looking at this thing. And his dad's like, get in the car, get in the car. And then they backed up. And then they took off and then they went a little further down the road and then they crossed over on Black Bull Bridge, which fortunately for them, the Black Bull wasn't there to block their path. But uh, Or maybe it would have fought the da- dog cat, man. <laughs> or maybe they would have, or maybe it would have came riding in on the, the dog cat, man, like, uh-huh. like He-Man does on Battle Cat. <laughs> it's like, I have the power to shapeshift and give you nightmares. So that's that story. And, you know, so, so that's the first one. Now there has been speculation. People have claimed stories in that area of my hometown. And I know Tony and I know Anthony and all of you guys have been with me and cause there's so many people who claim these, uh, stories about dog man and these cat people. And there it's very common belief from the locals of where I'm from. There's a lot of people who believe in this. They, they believe that those things exist. Some people believe that they are a type of shapeshifter, some people just believe that they are some sort of creature that runs out in the woods, you know, and you'll get stories of these creatures from Granger to Copeland and then from, you know, from Rice's Crossing down to Hutto and, you know, going, going to the West. And then on the East, you'll get them, you'll get stories all the way to, you know, Bastrop, you know, that, that, that these, that there's these creatures out there that run around and, and they do what they do. You know, I know that, uh, I wanted to do a show eventually about Byersville, there was a, a bar that was out there uh, for a long time, and and of course Byersville. There was an there was an area out in that area where I did a show about Dogman and and a poltergeist haunting that took place, and it was I did that on Vic's show. Can't remember what episode that was. I'm not going to even get into that, but it was that that area up there is is you know probably 15 miles from this, but that whole area is just full of spooky stories. You go into those woods, if you drive from like San, the San Gabriel River and you go up to all the way up to Lexington, it's just solid woods. There's very small little towns like Thorndale in between there. And then there's nothing but woods, 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 and more woods. And then creeks and, and lots of game, lots of deer. So if you were a creature that needed to eat, you would have plenty of game. I mean, even you know? in Austin, there's plenty of deer. Oh yeah. They're, they're <laughs> everywhere. I mean, they're everywhere. When my wife came from, from where she lived, you know, in the Antelope Valley and where there are no antelope and haven't been for a century, uh, she, you know, she, she wasn't used to seeing deer and she's like, look, we're driving by Apple, you know? And she's like, look, there's deer in the parking lot. I'm like, yeah, they're pretty much everywhere. Yeah, and she was just there. amazed by them, you know? And then we saw wild hogs a couple times, uh, off of, uh, Spicewood Springs. She's like, look at those hogs. I'm like, yep, they're pretty much everywhere. They're all over. Like if you're walking a trail in Austin, they'll tell you if it's rutting season, you better be careful because people have been, been hit with by stags, you know, and people have been chased by wild hogs and been had their legs gored, you know. I mean, th- these animals will just run around on the trails. I mean, it's nothing. But when you go further out into the woods out there where I'm from, it gets real creepy real fast. And uh, me and Nellie were out there enjoying the beauty, driving around one one day, and uh, she was just like, "Oh, it's so beautiful out here. It's so pretty and, and tranquil and whatever." And I told her, I said, "When it gets dark out here and you're on these backwood back roads." It gets real creepy.